Um, hi everyone, and thanks for joining the talk today. Um, I hope you're all doing well during lockdown number two. Um, my name is Davina Raji Pillay. Um, as Nathan said, I'm the co-founder and exec producer at Badlands, a film studio, but I'm also the founder of Raw Racism at Work, a platform to gain insights in racism at work. And that's what I wanna to talk to you um, a little bit about today. Um, I never used to like my name when I was a kid. Um, it always made people question where I came from and I have a typically long Tamil surname. Um, I wanted to be called something like normal, like Laura, like my best friend from primary school. Um, but I, I grew up in Northwest London in a predominantly uh, Asian and black um, area and school. But even with that being the case, um, I remember being about eight years old and walking to the shops with my mum and a group of children, probably around the same age as me, um, calling us packies and throwing stones at us. And it was in that moment that I realised I was different. Um, it was in that moment that I realised that somehow my value as a human being wasn't exactly the same. And I thought the reason why I didn't see um, people that looked like me on TV or in the books that I was reading or the toys that I was playing with was because there was something wrong with me. And that being the reason why those children said those unpleasant things and did those unpleasant things. And as I grew older and I encountered more experiences, worse experiences, somehow that one when I was a child was the one that uh, impacted me the most. Um, but why? Why was that one, you know, as a child with children who probably knew no better, why was that the one that stuck? Children start forming racial biases as young as three years old um, and they're learning from us what we do um, and don't do, uh, what we say and don't say. We're repeating patterns of behavior um, and cycles. And as you can see from this research on job discrimination by Nuffield College, we are taking these biases into our adult and work life. As brands, as creatives, um, it's our job to solve problems for our consumers and for our clients. Um, it's also our job to ensure that the work that we produce is representative of multicultural Britain. 64% of consumers are more likely to buy from a brand that takes a stance on a social issue. And so if you care about equality and social injustice, um, I invite you to learn with me today. Today, I want to talk about microaggressions. By definition, microaggressions are a statement, action or incident regarded as an instant, instance of indirect, subtle or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group such as ra racial or ethnic. The term was founded by um, a Harvard academic and psychiatrist, Chester M. Pierce. Um, it's, fairly main, it's fairly new in, term, in terms of the mainstream, um, and in, essentially they're a form of everyday discrimination, a hidden form of racism um, that can happen both consciously and subconsciously. On top of my day job, I've been advocating for diversity, equity, inclusion at work um, for a number of years now. And earlier this year, at the end of May, the tragic death of George Floyd and many others sparked the Black Lives Matters movement to go global. And with that, we saw pledges and commitments from brands and the advertising industry in support of the black community. And at the same time, a number of black people and people of color in my network reached out to me frustrated. They were frustrated because they felt that in order to adequately respond to these uprisings, um, the current uprisings, then business leaders needed to reckon with the black experiences in their workplaces. And a common theme that emerged from those conversations that I was having, but as well as like the, the black people that were calling out um, brands publicly, was the disconnect between a company's external um, external commitment um, and the daily employee experience. 
This disconnect is not new, but I think um, the awareness and the depth of it is novel for some. And so to show this disconnect, I created an anonymous survey called Have You Ever Experienced Racism at Work? Which, due to the number of responses, is now turned into RAW, an insights platform. Microaggressions is a key terminology, terminology to understand when talking about the black experience at work. But rather than me just talk about them, I want to show you some of the responses from the survey, some of the real life accounts that are happening in our, in our industry now. Now you might recognize some of these in yourselves because none of us are mute to them and they seem quite harmless, right? Like genuine mistakes or jokes, or perhaps, you know, people are being oversensitive. The reality is research shows us that regular exposure to racial microaggressions can cause more harm to mental health than overt acts of hate. Further research from neuroscientists and social psychologists shows that people who receive regular racial stress, such as microaggressions, can see the same brain patterns um, that, are, that occur in soldiers who have served at war and are now experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. This means that racial microaggressions show up in black people and people of color as trauma. So they're definitely no joke. What makes them and what makes what you just saw so dangerous is in isolation, they can seem so harmless. And so we often let them pass by without addressing them. It becomes this snowball effect, right? So a snowball that is this fun, play, playful thing, rolling down a snow covered mountain. And as it, as, it, as it rolls down the hill, the ball picks up more snow and gains more momentum until it gets to the bottom of a hill and bam, it can knock someone over. Well, what makes microaggression so difficult to tackle and so equally effective is we are, number one, unsophisticated in recognizing them in ourselves and each other. And number two, most people's understanding of racism is limited. As you can see from this definition, we've been accustomed to associating racism with when it was first, its definition of when it was first coined in 1902, which is, a single overt, intentional and conscious hate to one person by another person based on the sole belief that one's race is superior, is more superior. Now, if we take that definition, it means that if it wasn't conscious or intentional, most people don't think it's racism and therefore they think they're exempt from contributing to it and therefore nothing changes and it takes on a new format. Racism historically is known as this thing that terrible people do. You know, we associate with football hooligans and the KKK. But as we know, people who vote, well-meaning, kind-hearted people who love their children contribute to racism. We can see it happening today on social media. Uh, you know, here are some responses to Kamala Harris becoming the first South Asian and black woman American vice president. Um, the responses to the Sainsbury's Christmas ad that was released a few days ago, uh, featuring a black family. But as we are starting to see present society grappling with its, with its racist present, it seems to be a different story in the workplace. Microaggressions have nothing to do with being a good person or a bad person. They are a form of everyday discrimination that we've learned. And as a result, we have been taught to suppress our prejudice. And that prejudice sometimes comes out in what we, what we are talking about called microaggressions. Um, I read an article published by the Harvard Business Review in 2002. It was published so 18 years ago and it was called Dear White Boss. The article talks about the miasma of being a black employee. It was written by a black director, so someone in a high senior position. 
Um, and it was around what he would say if he had the chance to, to his white boss. And it was things like feeling alienated. Um, I'm not sure you fully believe in me. I don't fully trust you and race is always, and how race is always with me. He talks about how in uh, each story uh, taken in isolation, they may seem trivial, but how it's a cumulative effect that wears us down. Um, and as I was reading the article, I thought how little the sentiment of the black employee has changed. But why? Like that was 18 years ago, the article. Quite soon after I created the raw survey, I was invited to attend an industry roundtable by a publication with um, several white CEOs or, uh, in the advertising industry, of advertising industry, sorry. They were all extremely scared to talk about race, out of fear of making mistakes and to be seen not getting it right. The Raw platform has been created to help encourage more openness around race and racism by empowering employees to speak up about issues and putting the onus on employers to recognize this behavior uh, in the same way that hashtag time to has. The current moment has the potential to be pivotal in addressing this disconnect that I mentioned earlier between a company's statement or commitment externally versus the daily employee experience. But only if we as business leaders, as an industry, have the wherewithal to identify the harm being done to black employees and people of color. Because as Raw has shown us, it does exist. These are the targets that were set by IPA five years ago to reach by 2020. And as you can see, we are way off meeting those according to the stats released earlier this year from the IPA agency consensus. Now, if we get our house in order, uh, we will see retention rates, progression of these employees increase, and we will truly begin to harvest inclusive work cultures. And over time, we'll see the ethnicity pay gap decrease. But in order for us to create anti-racist work environment, environments, everyone, but especially business leaders, need to do these four things. Number one, educate yourselves on what racism at work really looks like. Number two, deal with your discomfort. The way we are socialized around racism leaves white people unpracticed and uncomfortable in talking about it, let alone able to lead on initiatives around race and racism. Number three is identify harm without being defensive. I think defensiveness is a common reaction when waking up to the realities that racism could be operating on your watch and in your business. And you may think, but I'm one of the good ones and focusing on your intent feels like you're being accused or being blamed. But there is no blame here in this conversation. It's about widening our understanding. I remember at uh, one of the previous agencies I worked for, there was a International Women's Day event and it was looking at the uh, female generational gap and how the more junior female um, uh, employees were feeling versus the more senior female employees and how things had changed. And one of the more junior panelists said that they'd felt that the gender gap um, you know, had closed at her level, but that um, there, was, there wasn't there was enough people of color like herself, and that made her feel uncomfortable. And this was met by the more white senior female panelists saying that she did not believe that to be the case. Number four is be accountable. Building the capacity to be anti-racist takes commitment um, over time and it involves hard work and it's not always pleasant. Um, brands should be asking their agencies what steps they're taking to make their workplaces more inclusive and to be giving uh, to give clarity on um, statistics, including pay. You know, why should an agency um, be cho a chosen partner if they can't represent your consumers? Uh, and these are some of the steps that I'm taking into my own business at Badlands. Through the raw survey, we can tackle those four steps. Um, I invite you to share the, the survey internally within your own businesses, 
so that we can, uh, so as an industry, we can use that data as a benchmark to measure change. The hard work is taking in the data and taking action as a result. And before I end, I just want to thank um, the partners of RAW so far. So the Barbershop Agency, um, Mother Agency, Brixton Finishing School, and all the amazing creatives that I've worked with so far. And thank you for listening. And thank you, Davina, for, for taking us through that. I think such an important message and, and so, so clearly put. I just wanted to ask you quickly before we go on to your 15 second summary, what would you say is the biggest thing you've learned through the racism at work survey? Has there been anything which you, which kind of surprised you that came out of all that, uh, all those responses? Um, I guess just the amount of people who are sort of suffering in silence, really. Um, one of the things that came out from the survey was how a lot of people do not speak up about it because they're very, af they're afraid nothing will be done essentially, uh, they don't see the point. So I think that was that was probably the most surprising thing that came out of it. Yeah. So Davina, unfortunately we're, we're out of time. So I have to just ask you for your, your 15 second summary. If you could summarize your message in 15 seconds, what would you want people to take away today? Um, it'd be the four things I ended on. So educate yourself, deal with your discomfort, um, identify harm without being defensive and be accountable. And you can do that through the raw survey. So, you know, feel free to get in touch with me afterwards.